a fully believe you. Uh, right then, so it's time for us to move on, I think. We've got, uh, well, before we move on, let's all just say thank you to uh, Miles from Acca, and we'll give him a clap. We've got a clap. <laughs> and uh, we're going to be moving over to Tom from uh, Universe uh, United Overalls. Can you tell we're entering the 24th hour of this? Uh, and also Hewitt Fabrics. Uh, which I need to find. Amanda, you could if you could find him and just bob him on while I just do a plug plug. That would be amazing. Uh, thanks to everybody that's taken part over the last 24 hours. Some guys have been in here for hours and hours and hours and hours and hours, to be fair. Uh, it's been a real privilege, a real pleasure. Uh, we are still selling tickets for the next hour, so if anybody can share that, the link is in my bio. There's tickets for the prizes. I'm not bothered with that too much more. And if you've just dropped along our YouTube feed, please subscribe and like. Uh, it does go a long, long way for us. So thank you very much. And, uh, well, I don't really feel like Tom needs an introduction. He's, he's as good at talking as me. So in that case, I shall just pass it over. Tom, I'll let you introduce yourself and introduce Chris. And you guys fire away. Amazing. Can you can you hear me okay? I'm all good. A little bit louder. Is that all right? <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. Thank you, Ben. Um, and thank you, Akadenim. That was a really interesting talk from him. Um, there's so much knowledge there. It's crazy. Um, so my name is Tom. Uh, I am the founder of a denim brand called United Overalls Co. We're... Oh, I am an English denim brand um, and we're super, super thankful to be here. So thank you so much, Amanda and Ben. Um, I bet you guys are absolutely knackered now. <laughs> <laughs> Go straight to bed after this. Um, so first, I'd like to hand over to Chris, who is from Hewitt Heritage Fabrics, uh, who makes the selvage denim for United Overalls Co. So he'll um, explain his story. Take it away, Chris. Oh, hi there. Can everybody hear me okay? Um, uh, yeah, it's great to be here. And thanks uh, to Tom for asking me to um, participate. Um, I still find, uh, I've been doing this for a lot of years now, and I still find it um, uh, amazing that people actually ask me to come and participate at these things. So uh, it's... Uh, uh, I'm always uh, I'm incredibly grateful for that. And uh, so my story uh, started uh, about 13 years ago. Uh, I wanted to, uh, I was hanging out with this uh, with a friend of mine, and we were. He was wearing. Um, I was wearing. Pretty much all I would wear at that point was full count and denim, and. Uh, I've been into selvage denim for a while, uh, Japanese selvage denim, and I, I'm a vintage uh, collector, so I've uh, I have a vintage archive, and uh, and I can and I've been wearing um, selvage Levi's since I was a kid, and uh, had always been into denim. Um, so I was hanging out with this friend of mine, and uh, he was wearing I was wearing full count denim, and he was wearing APC, and uh, we were both. Um, Back when APC was still made in Tunisia, when uh, they were, uh, I, I, you know, at their roots, and uh, we uh, came up with this uh, idea that we would create uh, a pair of jeans and try and make the best pair of jeans ever, and uh, you know, tall order. Uh, but uh, we felt we were young enough and tenacious enough to be able to do that, and uh, we uh, we went. Uh, we couldn't find, we had no idea what we were doing. And uh, so we uh, we would phone people up. I would phone brands up and say, can you tell me where you get your denim from? And uh, and I, I, it's, I got, I, I'm imagining it was, uh, well, I'm imagining today that it was a, a strange question to ask people because I would never get any reply. Like I would dead call people and they would be silent on the phone. And I go, hello, hello, are you there? And uh, eventually, uh, we uh, <laughs> or I would send an email and I would never get a reply. Uh, and uh, so finally, I, I had this moment where I thought, well, what about Levi's? Where does Levi's get their, their denim made? And that took me to uh, getting in touch with a guy called Ralph Thark, 
who was the technical director of Cone Mills of White Oak. And I see Ralph Tharp as he's like the Gandalf of uh, denim. And uh, he knows more about denim than anybody I've ever met in my entire life. And uh, we're still friends today. And, and he's very much influence, influences me today and helps me out with things. But I got in touch with him and we started, my business partner and I started to try and develop a uh, try, we tried to get Cone to change their dye from uh, what was uh, what they the generic indigo dye that they were using to getting to them to use um, uh, Dye Star GOTS certified, well, GOTS uh, version four pre reduced indigo. And, uh, you know, they were they weren't particularly interested in doing that. They were very much like, you know, we've, we've always done it this way, Chris, why should we do it differently for you? And uh, we almost made it there. And so we did all this thing with them and we, uh, I sampled some genes with them and uh, we eventually I flew over to, to see them and I was going to go to, uh, was, I went to meet them in New York and then I was going to go to, uh, uh, down to um, White Oak to see Ralph, and I got to the head office of, of, of Cone Denim in New York City, and we went upstairs, and it was amazing. I felt so special. It was so great to be there, and uh, we had I did this really great uh, meeting with uh, their head of um, sales, and then when I was leaving, he asked me if I would like to get another coffee, but outside of the building. And so I said, sure, yeah, no problem. So we go downstairs, we go across the street, we go across the street to this coffee shop. He gets me a coffee, he pays for it, he brings me outside, we're standing on Broadway, and he said, you know, Chris, that thing that we were doing with you, we don't want to do that anymore. And I was like, what? <laughs> like, what do you mean you don't want to do it anymore? Like, like I've been doing this, like, I, it was so intense for me. I'd been in this thing for so long with, with Ralph and with, with Cone Mills and all of this thing. And, and then they just were like, we don't want to do that anymore. You know, we're not interested in doing um, organic denim with you. <laughs> like, okay, fine. Like, maybe you could have told me that before I flew here, but that's okay. And, but I, I then, like, a couple of days later, I went down to see, I met Ralph at White Oak. And, you know, the disappointment that I had had on Broadway was just swept to the side when I walked into White Oak and I, I I saw the machines and I had the tour and I was there with Ralph and, you know, and I, I didn't give up the kind of friendship and relationship that I have with Ralph Tharp today. You know, I wouldn't give that up and, and it was worth it. You know, the disappointment was worth it. So that started a whole journey of me trying to create a denim label. Um, and it, you know, I'd like to say well, I'm going to tell you right now, it wasn't a success. It was a, an unmitigated disaster and uh, for me. And because basically I had no idea what I was doing. And what I was, what I had originally started with was an idea to make a pair of jeans. And what I like about Tom is he's made a pair of jeans, right? And he's made the best possible pair of jeans he can make. And that's a really, really unique thing. And, 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 and I think that that's really important. And what, you know, my, you know, my only kind of, wisdom from from that first experience would be you know if you want to make something just make one thing make it good and people if you make something really good and it's of really good quality people will buy it and they'll buy into your story and they'll buy into you as a person and that and, and I believe that to be true you know for me what happened was this <laughs> I, I went from making a pair of jeans to having a 75 piece collection that was being made all over the world I was trying to be really ethical so I was getting hats knitted by um, Peruvian refugees uh, in the middle of North Carolina, you know, in between uh, 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 like Raleigh and uh, Greensboro in the middle of nowhere. And I had sweaters being made in Peru by organic alpaca. And it was, it was crazy. And I was having my jeans made in Canada. And at the end of it, what it, all it was, was it was just a really good learning exercise of how to keep things small and keep things tight so that you can and so that you can grow in a way that is uh, organic and uh, so when this all ended uh, i came back to i stopped everything my business advisor said you know what i said what do i do and he said you just have to stop I, and i said okay so i he said you need to call the people some people are going to understand and some people aren't going to understand and that was the case i phoned up some people and they were like 
you know, I will never deal with you again. And I found up other people and they were like, yeah, it's okay, man. I understand. And in that, when I came back and I was in this, this space where I didn't know what to do with myself because I had been so dedicated to this, this, this cause for like four years, it was really intense. And I wait, you know, it cost me huge amounts of money. I had this thought that early on in my journey with when I still had a business partner, I had said, why can't we just make the denim in the UK? And he said to me, don't be stupid. No one makes denim in the UK. And I was like, well, and then in that moment, I thought, well, why doesn't anybody make denim in the UK? And I can tell you now I understand why no one makes denim in the UK. But I thought in that moment that I, and I was still thinking of creating a denim label. And in the, but in that moment, I, I wanted to be able to control the process. I wanted to be able to produce everything close to home. I wanted to be able to sew my jeans here. I wanted to be able to make everything that I made here. And I also wanted to be able to weave my cloth here. And so what started as, as a, a process of having a clothing label where I produced all of my own fabric eventually turned into me becoming a fabric producer. And so today I have uh, a company called Hewitt Heritage Fabrics and I've been, I launched in uh, November, 2016. And it was, I thought that it would, it would be absolutely smooth sailing right from the get go. And, uh, and, and it, and I can tell you that it just wasn't, I was, I was bringing a product to market in the UK that had not been produced here. Um, denim had been produced here. De the last denim mill in the UK closed uh, before me closed in 1993. Uh, it was called uh, Smith and Nephew. And uh, they wove a lot of denim. They wove a lot of denim for Levi's. They wove any, if you see jeans from British jeans from the 1960s and 70s, 50s, 60s and 70s, they were more than likely woven there. The fabric was more than likely woven there. Uh, but they weren't big on doing selvage denim. And selvage denim has never really uh, been a thing here. Uh, we, they, Mills created like a two by one twill for military clothing. Um, you might have seen like a, a, a green khaki selvage jackets. Uh, there's like a, it's like denim loose on that they that the British Army used to wear in the 40s and 50s. And that was produced here, but but it went straight into the military, so it wasn't sold as a commercial product. Uh, and it's not a three by one twill, uh, so it's not very heavy. Um, and that was produced here, but. Denim was never really commercially produced here because, and even when it was being woven at Smith and Nephew, it 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 was going into uh, a direct to market, so that it wasn't a wholesale product. Like the people that producing denim out of that product were not wholesalers, so they were just going direct to market, so they could sell it for cheap. And the reason why it never became commercial was because the cost price here was the. Uh, was the wholesale price out of America. So it was just never viable. And uh, so I then decided that I, I wanted to uh, launch this product. And, and because and the difficulties in the UK with uh, producing denim here is that uh, you have to deal with UK weavers who are um, notoriously difficult and uh, very much like don't like to, even though you're bringing to them a product that they have no idea how to make, they still want to tell you that they know how to make it better than you. Uh, and so you have to you have to maneuver through that. And then also making in the UK because I'm not I you know I'm a I contract people to weave for me. I am not a vertically integrated denim mill. And uh, as a result of that, there are large, there are different, there are processes. I have to get my yarn, uh, you know, dyed and, and sized onto beam from my yarn supplier, which is in Italy and, and Turkey. I then have to get it shipped here. I then have to weave it and then I have to have it finished. 
And all of those processes are taking place in different places. So they all add to the cost. And, you know, one of the, the biggest hurdles for me has been uh, convincing people to pay two pounds more a meter uh, for, for a denim or three pounds more a meter for a denim uh, at landed, you know. So that's been the biggest hurdle. It's like trying – there's this whole thing about – making you know in the uk and it's 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 easier to 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 convince someone like tom because he believes in that and it's well you know it's easier because that's what he wants to do or or british smaller british brands it's it's easier to to have that conversation with them however it's really hard to get someone like paul smith to buy fabric from you because they don't you know they're they pay nothing for their salvage denim. They make their product in, uh, you know, in the Far East, and they, and all of those things. So that they're, you know, those price points that they're married to, they don't want to pay more money for denim. So it's that has been, you know, the biggest. Also, CMT in the UK is, is not cheap. Um, so, you know, I can get a pair of jeans made in Quebec for twenty four dollars, which is about. 18 quid uh, and they'll be made just as well as they are made anywhere. Uh, you know, all the bells and whistles, one piece fly chain stitch, the end of the waistband, all of those things. And I remember having a conversation with a CMT here years ago saying I could ship my denim to Canada, pay the duty, the tax, ship it back, pay the duty, the tax and the VAT and the whole product will cost less than your CMT price. So the two hurdles that, you know, that are facing me is in the UK, it's very expensive for people to use my denim and make their product here. And then if they're not dealing with a direct to market model, uh, if they're looking to wholesale, we had a, a customer that uh, made some jeans out of uh, a linen weft uh, selvage that I do, and they were retailing them for 700 quid. Um, so... You know that's not for everyone. Like I, I couldn't even. Yeah, like I couldn't even afford to buy jeans <laughs> that cost that much money. Like I mean, like and and I, I would be, you know, I wouldn't even be able to do that. I wouldn't be able to, you know. So, you know, there's a lot of, you know, though I love it, and there's a lot of, uh, it's an, a fantastic uh, project, and I'm married to it now. It is, you know, it, it's a, a a difficult project, and. Uh, you know, but I have faith that it will uh, it will pull through. So that's uh, the story of Hewitt Heritage Fabrics, and uh, I have uh, I know that things don't particularly work well through Zoom, um, but we do. I do have some samples here, and uh, got eighteen people on today. So if you know, if you let me know, I can send you out some little sample packets with some fabric in them. So if you want to send me your emails and chat, um, I can do that for you. Um, uh, just a quick one, Chris. Sorry, I, I don't mean sure. to interrupt you, buddy. No, no, go on. You you should stop me. No, yeah, like I'm, I think there's uh, nearly 30 people watching on YouTube. Uh, oh, wow. They can't send you that information by okay. the chat. So it, it might be an idea for you to just uh, plug an email address, website, uh, social media platforms right now, buddy, and, and, and I'll let you carry on. I just didn't want them to miss out because I'm not on Zoom, that's all, brother. Okay, so I, my my website is uh, Hewitt Heritage or heritagefabrics.co.uk. And if you just go through them, there's uh, there's some picture, there's some videos there. Uh, the the mill that I will I use two Northrop looms, so two Northrop shuttle looms, 1950s Northrop shuttle looms, which make a great denim. Uh, they are the closest thing to a draper that you would get, you would have gotten at White Oak. And uh, the the Mr. Northrop, who was from Keithley in Yorkshire, took his shuttle motion to the Draper brothers in America, and they created the Northrop Draper loom. So... Uh, denim as we know it uh, may not have been a thing if it wasn't from for our man from Keithley. Uh, so, uh, you know, it's intrinsic. Denim is actually, as we know it, 
intrinsically British, right? So, uh, because it just never would have, it may never have happened. Like, I'm sure they would have invented it, but I, it may never have happened or it might not have happened in the same way. You know, if you change the timeline, things sometimes don't happen in the same way. Uh, I'm also on uh, Instagram and there's some videos there of the looms weaving. Uh, and But two Northrop looms aren't going to, they produce about 20,000 meters of fabric a year. They, they weave very slowly. Uh, so we're, you know, in the process of bringing uh, more shuttle looms online so we can increase our capacity. And, and that's going to be happening in the not too distant future. Um, so yeah, if you go there and you send me an email, there's an email address there and uh, I can send you out some, a sample piece of denim and you can see what we can, we can do. And, and the denim that I send out will have been denim that has been woven on those uh, Northrops. So, How did you come across the looms, Chris? Uh, I phoned every single mill in the UK. I found this old book called McRae's Blue Book. And uh, it, it's like it used to list all of... Uh, um, it had all of the weavers in the UK from like from ever, forever. And uh, so I would phone them up and a deadline, 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 deadline. And then eventually I found this guy and he said, oh yeah, I can do that for you. So he wove me some fabric, some selvage, and it came back and I was like, wow, this is, this is amazing. And, uh, and then he decided he didn't want to do it with me. And I said, well, can you tell me where the, the people that wove that for you is, the, the loom, so I can talk to them? And he said, no, no, I, why would I do that? Why would I tell you that? And I said, well, so that I can, I can, you know, move move forward from this this point right here. And as I said, I mentioned earlier about weavers. And so I, he said, no, I'm not going to give that information to you. So then that took another year by a process of elimination for me to find the weaver. And uh, yeah, so it, you know, it's. Uh, yeah, it was an amazing, you know, and then when I went and I phoned them up and I said, can you make selvage denim for me? And they said, what What do you mean by selvage denim? And I said, a, a denim with a fast selvage. And they said, absolutely. And I went up to see them and uh, there they were. Mm. The two Northrop looms covered in tarpaulins uh, and wrapped in bungee cords uh, in, the, in the corner. And then we dusted them off and we got them weaving again. Um, and so that was pretty amazing. Yeah, that is amazing. And just to uh, a comment just came in uh, from our buddy uh, Morsin, who we're all familiar with. Well, the global denim man is definitely familiar with. Uh, says hundred percent correct about the Northrop, uh, Chris. So that sounds good. Uh, anyway, crack back on. So. Yeah, so we've been, uh, like one of the things that uh, I started to just weave 100% uh, cotton, and then I uh, wanted to uh, do a linen denim, but, you know, it's very, we, when you're starting like any kind of project or where you're doing a lot of trying to increase your range, it, there are it, just so many costs involved. And, and like one of actually, you know, the weavers, I found the, the, the loom, but then I had to find the yarn. And uh, so back when I was looking for indigo yarn, uh, again, the same thing, I would phone a denim mill and say, can I buy your indigo yarn? And they would say, no, why don't you just buy, buy our denim? And I said, look, I, I think your denim, denim is really great, but I don't want to buy your denim. I just want to buy your yarn. And, uh, I remember that people, no one would speak to me. And then I finally spoke to some uh, a Japanese uh, guy and he said that he could get it for me, but he wanted um, 54 euros to kilogram, which is like, I now, I pay currently um, like roughly uh, six euros a kilogram. So... He wanted $54 a kilogram. That's horrendous. And, and I was like, and, and, and what I what I understood was is that he just didn't want to sell me yarn. So he just wanted to have a conversation with me, say, yeah, I'll do that for you. This is how much it will cost. 
but but all that was and and I learned that you know from speaking to lots of people this basically if someone charges you or quotes you an unreasonable price it's because they just don't want to do business with you and uh and and it's I, I guess it's it's I guess people just have difficulty just saying no uh so uh and and I quite like people that are upfront and honest I just want people to say yes or no if I ask you a question yes or no uh because what it what happens is is in my experience of finding yarn like and I went everywhere like I went to some guys in India that just put pictures of Morrison rope dyeing machines on their website but they didn't have the machinery they just had a picture of it and so they would send me yarn and I would take it out of the bag and it would have indigo dandruff and that was because they had not they had you know or some people might have had a dying dying range but they didn't use they didn't really know how to use it so they didn't put enough chemical to reduce the indigo into the yarn so none of it and it literally you would shake it and it would rain indigo the particles would come off of the yarn and so you can't use that and that's again the same thing about yes or no is that you know you phone someone and they say something and and when you're a small business time is money right and when you're spending 3 months or 2 months pursuing uh, uh, a route to market and someone is telling you something and they can't actually do that for you, uh, which is which is the same, you know, an experience that I've had. I, I When I launched in 2016, we were using a finisher that was able to get us four and four. So 4% stability warp and weft, which is really where you want to be is one, one to 3% warp and weft, but 4% in the weft is, is 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 it's pretty good it, it's a it, it's a standard that you can work to and we were able to get uh four and four but then that finisher didn't write down what they did so they were never able to repeat that uh so uh, but then you would go to another finisher and you would say can you do this for me and they'd say yes i can we can do that and they just never were able to do it so i've been on this four-year finishing journey which at times have been like literally Oh, like I am literally going to scream if I just can't wait, make this work, uh, and that has ended. Now we now uh, have a finisher that is is capable of doing all of the things that, that that I need them to do. But but again, it's just that. But with the yarn, trying to find the yarn was like took me two years, and eventually I phoned a dye uh, supplier in uh, Malaysia. Uh, that I found just, you know, I was always on the internet trying to find these leads. And I, I phoned this this guy in Malaysia and I said, Could, can you supply me with, because at that point I was saying, can you, I was going to get the dye to try and get someone to dye the yarn for me uh, through, like it, it just became so complicated. And he said to me, give me, give me a day, I'll come back to you. And a day later he sent me an email and he said, there's this company in Hong Kong that has a Morrison rope dyeing machine. They're expecting a telephone call. And that's where I was able to go. And I was able to finally get some yarn out of these people in, uh, in Hong Kong. And they were great. And they were really good to me. But it, again, it was an expensive process of trying to ship large amounts of yarn on cone from Hong Kong to the UK. And then processing it here getting it from creel onto the, the yarn, from creel on the cone onto the beam and then sized. All a lot of expenses. And then you have minimum orders that you have to meet with all different stages of the process. And then also when you're using yarn, when you're taking indigo yarn that is, so if an indigo yarn is put onto a beam and then reconed, something happens to it. It goes, it's in, like this, so the yarn goes through a little hole and then it goes onto a winding machine and and that changes the 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 proportion of the yarn it it it, it affects it it makes it slightly fuzzy and so and chips away a bit of the indigo and makes it slightly unstable so when you're looking to to stop rub dry and wet rub or especially dry rub 
that that will be affected. So then that goes on to become, and then that cone has to go through a creel onto a beam. And again, it goes through, it rubs against something. And then that also uh, affects the R, affects the stability of the indigo. And so what happens is, is then you beam it and then you size it. And you then get, when you walk, when you weave, you get a variation, a slight variation, sometimes a streaking in the fabric. And, uh, and that's why sometimes people, when they're using yarn that's being coned to creel, to, is that they don't use it in the warp, they use it in the weft. Because, but that's quite technical. <laughs> so that's now, but now, so I then wanted to get away from using coned yarn to build the warps. So now I have moved to a news yarn supplier. So I send my beams out to uh, Italy to have my, um, my the yarn beam right onto the, sized and right onto the beam so that we don't have the streaking. And so, and then now, so what we'll do with that new yarn supplier is uh, Ralph Tharp and I are going to start developing uh, different yarns. So putting a, you know, a, yarn, a long and a short slub into a yarn so that we get uh, as close to, so if we start weaving on more modern shuttle looms, we're able to create a fabric that looks as close to, uh, uh, you know, early Levi's fabric uh, woven on a draper, but we can do that on, on, on a more modern shuttle loom. Because the problem with you know, one of my new yarns, the dyers is a slasher dyer. So that gives you a very flat yarn and then a very flat look, especially if woven in a more modern shuttle loom, you end up with a flatter look. And, you know, the Italians do that extremely well. And I don't really want to, you know, be known as the person that makes Italian looking denim in the UK. So, you know, they do it really well. And, you know, I love all, of, you know, it's great. But I just, the, the character that you get off of the Northrop, I, I want to be able to recreate that on, on more modern looms. And especially when we go to start weaving uh, non selvage full widths is to also be able to in, incorporate that character into the fabric is really important for me. So. I look forward to seeing it. Um, it'd be definitely something I jump on. So <laughs> get as close to that Levi's look as possible, I think. Uh, so, and then we're doing other things like putting English uh, wool across the weft to uh, to give, uh, you know, uh, there's an interesting the Union Army in a in a um, in America used to make a, a fabric which was a a cotton warp with a wool weft, and it was called Jean fabric. If I uh, my research is right and that jean fabric was used because it was it was uh, uh lighter weight uh less uh you know the soldiers wouldn't get so hot in it and it also the the when you washed it with the the wool and the cotton it gave a, a certain water repellency and uh yeah so that's we i started doing that and uh we're now going to probably move away from using 100% British wool to start using a recycled British wool. Uh, and that will enable to bring the price down because um, British wool is, uh, is not cheap. And also, with, when you use British wool, uh, we use a Leicester blue face, blue face in, in the yarn, which is basically the, the softest. There's one flock of merino uh, sheep in the UK, but uh, I think they're owned by a brand. So the softest you can get is Lester Blueface, and it's still quite, you know, I wouldn't want to wear that, you know, on a hot summer's day next to my skin. So, but we're looking at that, and then we're looking at using, uh, getting into using hemp, um, trialing with some hemp across the weft now and trying to get an indigo uh, dyed hemp yarn uh, and just moving and trying to, you know, do lots of different things. Uh, getting into using nettle and other uh, kind of more eco-sustainable crops and uh, looking into using foam indigo. And and then there's, you know, always trying to, you know, it's really important for me to, 
to I would love to get to a place where I'm able to grow an, a crop and use an indigenous crop to spin a yarn, to dye it here, uh, and uh, and so to have from yarn to finished product, you know, a totally British product. Um, and uh, yeah, I think I, I could probably get there <laughs> with a little bit of investment. So. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing! Thank you so much, Chris. That was um, thank you. Good chat. I, I learned so much. It's um, good to good to see. Um, okay, I'm gonna kick off uh, explaining who I am. Um, for those that don't know me uh, and see my madness, uh, I'm Tom. Uh, basically, my kind of denim journey started while I was working in a Levi store down in Bromley in southeast London. Uh, which isn't worth a visit. Don't go there. Not, not important place. Um, and I kind of got into the history behind the brand. Um, you know, certainly we didn't stock any of the LVC stuff, but you're taught a lot about the 501 history and um, a lot of the different changes that went into the 501s over the years. So, you know, if you go back to the 19, uh, 1890s, um, you know, you wouldn't recognize jeans as they are now. Um, I've always been a bit of a history buff. So that piqued my interest. I've never been into fashion necessarily, but um, the history side of it really appealed to me. Um, after Levi's, I worked at a beautiful store called Son of a Stag in London, um, who we saw yesterday. Missed that. But, uh, and there I learned a lot about, you know, the Japanese side of it, the history of those brands, what they did. Um, I had some amazing jeans. So these are a lovely pair of Onis. Some good fading on those. Those are my first pair of proper Japanese. Um, loved the, if you can see it, the lower wreath buttons. Um, and one thing that really piqued my interest was the 100% cotton threading that they're constructed with. Um, that's something that kind of really changed my outlook of what a jean can be. Moved on to something a bit heavier, 24 ounce Samurais. Don't know if you can see the fading on those. They're pretty hardcore. Um, had many painful days working in them. Um, the backs of my knees with those creases was so painful. I cannot even tell you. Bending down in a shop in those was oh, brutal. <laughs> um, so yeah, that kind of really like expanded my knowledge of um, you know what jeans can be and the lengths of the Japanese brands went to perfectly produce that exact model of, you know, this is a 40s model 501. You need this particular thread color. You need these particular rivets, this particular detail. Um, and then from there, I actually participated in the very first Black Horse Lane workshop, creating a pair of jeans over two days that was run by the amazing Mosin from Endrime. Can see me, hello, Mason. Um, he's like my my senpai for denim. <laughs> so I'll show you my pair. So I made these bad boys. Um, so as you can see, one piece salvage fly. Ba -ba -bam. Lots of other details around the jeans. I'd done denim pocket bags because I wanted them nice and durable. It seemed good at the time. Um, it turns out quite bulky. And then obviously a lot of the construction methods are completely clean, no overlocking at all. So you can turn these inside out and they pretty much look as good as jeans, not turned inside out. Um, which again, you know, expanded my knowledge of what jeans can be, you know, tenfold. Um, you know, it's very similar to Japanese brands like Stevenson Overall, where it's lots of French felled seams, which is so time consuming to construct with. Um, it, it's absolutely crazy the amount of time that can go into a pair of jeans when you're not using overlocking or the cheaper 
construction methods that maybe some of the more traditional Japanese 501 brands use. Um, so then I kind of had all that knowledge bubbling around in my brain um, and, you know, daydreamed like, oh, you know, I'd love to start a brand. That would be the dream. Um, and, you know, I, I knew, you know, I wanted this from that brand. I loved what that brand done with the buttons and the rivets. You know, I wanted 100% copper rivets and laurel wreath buttons and but all these different ideas bumming around in my head. Daydreaming at work when I probably should be working. Um, and then kind of stumbled across Chris's website while browsing the interwebs and was just like, holy moly, this, this is what's going to make the brand. You know, there was so much story to Hewitt Heritage, um, you know, the history behind the Northrop plumes from the 1950s. And I was like, that is it. That, that's what I want my brand to be made from. Um, the only trouble was I didn't know anything about manufacturing or designing. <laughs> um, so first port of call was asking my dad, who's an accountant, whether it was a good idea. <laughs> and surprisingly, he said yes, which I was a bit like, oh, that's the first. Um, and then got in touch with the guys at Black Horse Lane who are an Atelier jeans maker in North London. And I'd met them in my times at Son of a Stag. Um, was at their opening parties and knew Han and Annie quite well. Um, and just basically said to them, what would I need to do to start a brand? And they very helpfully said, this, this is what you'd need to send us. Um, draw out a design sheet, um, technical drawing. Didn't know what technical drawing was, so Googled that quickly. <laughs> Found out how to use Photoshop and didn't know how to use Photoshop. So learned that one as well. Um, all self-taught, all self-taught. It's amazing. Uh, and sent over the designs. We worked through some samples. Um, there were, you know, all these criteria I had in my head that Black Horse Lane managed to bring out into a physical product, um, which I can show you. And this is what we came up with. Bum, bum, bum. So these are our ED1 jeans, which just stands for English Denim 1, because I believe they're the first denim jeans made with your denim, right, Chris? Um, yeah, you were, well, you were the first English brand. Yeah, to, to make a five. To make a five, to make a, you know, a traditional five pocket yeah. pair of jeans. We, we, like to the level, yeah. right? Yeah, 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 definitely. And kind of... Um, yeah, it's definitely one of the things that I had in my head when I was making them was that I, I wouldn't cut any corners on the details I wanted. So I was constantly pestering Black Horse Lane being like, you know, can you do this? Can you put this in? Um, so for example, you know, sewn in belt loops to the waistband, the single piece fly, um, as I mentioned before, all felt seams, there's not a single piece of overlocking on the jeans. Um one thing that I love about them is that they've got really big front pockets because I've got massive hands. <laughs> Isn't great on like Japanese jeans where they've got tiny front pockets and like, I can't get my phone out. Um, so big, big front pockets to hold as much stuff as you want them and really big pocket bags. So, you know, you're never going to struggle to get your phone out. Um, one of the things that I kind of had to source from outside of the UK was the buttons, the rivets, and the cotton thread. Um, so we, I actually bought them from Japan. Um, so they're traditional lower wreath World War II buttons. Um, and the rivets are 100% copper rivets uh, that are universal brand. Um, so the same rivets that are used on brands like Oni and other Japanese brands. Um, so they, over time, will um, 
start to patina really nicely with the jean as you start to wear them. Um, so there's all these little details that I wanted to include because um, I felt like there was no one else really in the UK producing jeans to the same levels as the Japanese masters. Um, I, I don't think they're as good as <laughs> some of the Japanese ones, but <laughs> maybe, maybe some people say, I hope so. <laughs> um, so yeah, that's, um, we made 50 pairs. Um, so obviously making them in such a small run, um, which Black Horse Lane was very kind enough to allow us to do um, as their production ramped up. They asked for bigger and bigger production runs, but as we were such good friends, they let us produce 50 pairs. Um, so it's a very limited thing, but I'd love to continue the brand in the future. I've got ideas for some lovely cinch back straight cut jeans, which we'd like to make in the future, um, probably with some hemp denim from Chris, um, which should be beautiful. And that's about it, really. Um, do we have time, Amanda and Ben, to crack out the denim quiz? Um, if you can leave us five minutes at the end, then go for it. I mean, I can start now. There's 20 <laughs> questions. Has everyone got pens and papers? Give us all a hell yeah in the comments. Okie dokie. I will start. Yes, there's a hell yeah. <laughs> okay, so denim quiz, whoop whoop 2020, global hangs. <laughs> Question one, what type of weave is denim traditionally made in? That should be quite an easy one. Question two, on a Gap Jean commercial in 2003, Madonna appeared together with which famous American rapper, Eminem, Notorious B.I.G., or Missy Elliott? If anyone needs me to repeat, then just shout out in the comments. Question three, which model in the Levi's vintage clothing range is the only pair with belt loops, suspender buttons, and a cinch back? Thank you, David James Simeon Martin. Question four, what brand was started by the grandson of the inventor of the riveted pantaloon? I won't say his name because I'll give it away. Question five, which Japanese denim brand is represented by a buffalo on their arcuate. This is quiet. What's happening? Doing the quiz. Oh. <laughs> Everyone's thinking. Yeah, okay, get it. Those gears going. I, I ain't got the capacity for that juice now. <laughs> After all these hours. Imagine no, brain no. just dribbling out. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no worries. Uh, we've we've got about six or seven minutes left. Is that all right for the for the quiz, matey? Yeah, I'll do probably about fifteen questions and then I'll do the answers. Okay, it's only so we can. Uh, Basically, it's, going to, it's just going to stop recording bang on 12 o'clock, mate. So we just need a couple of minutes to... Okay. <laughs> That's all. Question six. What is the name of the looms used by Hewitt Heritage Fabrics? I think people have been listening. 
you get this wrong, Chris, that'd be embarrassing. <laughs> Great question. <laughs> question seven. Which now defunct brand patented the single piece fly? I know Mason will get this. Question eight. Which brand recently released a limited edition range named the Book of Five Rings? Question nine. Which brand is famous for being the first denim brand to use Zimbabwe cotton? Question 10. What was the name of the Cone Mill site in Greensboro, North Carolina? Question 11. What was the name given to the agreement in 1915 that they struck with Levi's? And we'll do one last question. What is the name of the... No, wrong one. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. What is the name of the company who purchased the old looms from Cone Mills? Uh, we'll do one bonus one. Why not? Where in the world was the earliest recorded use of indigo found? A bit of an archaeology question. Okay, give me a thumbs up. Oh, that is a very simple Pardon? I said, that is a very soothing voice. That, that also belongs on radio too. <laughs> <laughs> and the travel today. <laughs> I could do the weather. I don't mind doing the weather. Okay, let's do answers. Question one. What type of weave is denim traditionally made in? It is three by one weave. Three what? One by. Um, question two, on a Gap Jean commercial in 2003, Madonna appeared together with Missy Elliott. Sweet's got that one. <laughs> sweet, sweet, sweet. <laughs> good sweets, good sweets. Uh, question three, which model in the Levi's vintage clothing range is the only one with belt loops, suspender buttons, and a cinch? It is the 501 1933. Question four, what brand was started by the grandson of the inventor of the riveted pantaloon? It's Ben Davis, the little gorilla symbol. Question five, which Japanese denim brand is rep there, represented by a buffalo? It is Ferro's. Question six, what is the name of the looms used by Chris at Hewitt Heritage Fabrics? They are Northrop looms. Sweet, sweet, sweet. <laughs> Question seven, which now defunct brand patented the single police fly? Don't have to spell this right. It's Nudstadter Bros. Hopefully you learn something with this quiz as well. <laughs> Educational as well. Uh, question eight. Which brand recently released a limited edition range named the Book of Five Rings? Was Samurai Jeans, which we saw earlier this morning. I got up for oh, 
Much to well, sweet, you missed that. <laughs> <laughs> a few hours that you missed. <laughs> Which brand is famous for being the first denim brand to use Zimbabwe cotton? That is Full Count. Question 10. What was the name of the cone mill site in Greensboro, North Carolina? It is White Oak. Go sweet. Go sweet. Go sweet. Go sweet. What was the name given to the agreement in 1915 that they struck with Levi's? It's the Golden Handshake. <laughs> Virtual handshake for everyone. <laughs> Question 12, what is the name of the company who purchased the old looms from Cone Mills? It's Vidalia Mills. I hope I said that right. God knows. And bonus question, where was the earliest recorded use of indigo? The answer is Peru. It's just a curveball. Some of mine are known. <laughs> and that is it. That is your denim quiz for Global Denim Hang. 2020. Hope everyone got some right. <laughs> Everybody should. You've got one minute to all put how many you got right in the comments, and then at least yeah. you can identify a winner. Oh, seven from Amanda. Amazing. Wonder how YouTube done. Uh, well, thank you for having me and Chris, Amanda, and Ben. I'm sure you cannot wait to get to bed. <laughs> I hope you enjoy that. Um, I'm pinching Amanda just for 10 minutes after this. <laughs> on the first time, and then, then he's dead. Um, and just like to do a shout out to the Worn Out Global team, who um, are our guys from London and Sons of Selvage podcast, you saw earlier. Um, and thank you to everyone else who was on Global Denim Hangs as well. So thank you very much and well done. Well done, Amanda and Ben and Yorkshire Denim all for setting it all up as well. Um, if you haven't bought a raffle, buy a raffle. If you bought one, buy two. If you bought two, buy four. Sports. <laughs> uh, just a little shout out to United Overalls. United Overalls are one of the brands that have donated towards the raffle, which will be drawn uh, automatically in five minutes. So anybody that's bought a ticket, I'm not going to lie, we, it's the first time we've used this website. I'm not sure if you get an instant email, you know, a minute after midday or if it takes a few hours. Uh, I know I get an email of all the winners. Again, I don't know if I get it a minute after midday or sometime in the next few hours, but I can assure you, if you've won, you get an email and it looks like you've got a one in four chance of winning something, which is... Uh, which is really great. I think for next week, Amanda, I'm going to auction some stuff off just to finish off the fundraising, I reckon. Uh, I reckon there'll be a few more bits donated and we'll do it that way. Tom and Chris, thank you very, 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 very much for finishing the show for us. That's still last week. <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I mean, I've already had a one-to-one -one with Tom, but I'd love a one-to-one -one with you, Chris, outside of the actual... Global Denim Hang, because we do do little sort of half an hour to one hour videos that we're recording for the YouTube. Uh, just right. casually. So I'll, I'll reach out on Instagram, obviously. I'm, I'm sure we're not going to miss each other, are we, mate? So, yeah, if you're up for that, I'll be in touch. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much. I appreciate and, uh, it. I'm not sure if it's any, any, I'm not sure if it's a way of saying this right now. There's only three minutes left, but the link is in my bio to the raffle. There is 41 prizes. <laughs> We've done about 250 tickets. <laughs> so if you've got a chance, go and buy some tickets. If not, uh, thank you very much to all the people that have bought tickets. If you're finishing up on YouTube, click like, click subscribe, do all that stuff that you hear all other YouTube people say. Uh, and Because uh, it does go a long, long way. It has been a very, very, very fun 24 hours. I've kind of forgot what happened between 12 and 6 a.m. if I'm completely honest. Even though we're away, I kind of have no idea. I feel like it's all just merged into one, but it's definitely been fun. And if anybody wants to get involved in the next one with me and Amanda more as part of the team, please do let us know. I feel like we've, we've, we've put foundations in place now. We've got technical stuff in place. Uh, all we need now is people to join team that want to get involved. Uh, you know, and, and, and help us improve the event. It'd be amazing if you could. You can get in touch with me at clubacan.com. You can get in touch with Amanda on 23 ounce indigo. 
And we have actually got Global Dennyman email addresses now, haven't we? Even though we've not used them. So it'll be Ben at GlobalDennyman.com and Amanda at GlobalDennyman.com. That's absolutely brilliant. And the live stream is going to end in 90 seconds. Please, somebody else say some things because I am fed up of um, my own. Ben, you forgot. Thanks to everybody who was watching. Thanks to all the amazing speakers. It was awesome. Everybody did amazing. And I hope everybody enjoyed it because we did. It it all came together, thank God. The Zoom worked. We didn't know if it would. So thank you so much. And thanks to the Swedes for being there. Sweet, 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 sweet. Yeah, big thanks. Some lads. <laughs> Brilliant. Massive thanks to everybody who took part because we couldn't have done it without everybody's help. And, oh my God, is this where I end the meeting? <laughs> it probably is, isn't it? Right. Oh, uh, we need the jingle. <laughs> I know, we do. We do need the jingle. Yeah. Uh, uh, we've had some nice comments come in. Everybody just saying basically they've enjoyed it, which is great. Thank you very much. And Amanda, I'll call you up in two minutes. And other than that, everybody else have a lovely Sunday. And uh, thank you very much for coming. Much love. Bye. Bye, guys. See you later. Bye. -bye. Bye.